one of the things that God wants to do in your life is to reconcile you to him. Reconcile you to him. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done. He wants you to come back home. Amen. But when you come back home, he wants you to do something for him. Be like him. Be a reconciler. Be a reconciler. You see, our world is completely overtaken by all kinds of uh, perversions and evil injustice. And as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to take a strong stand against such dark misdeeds. We need to counter the attack of the enemy on our world in our generation. We need our society, our community to reap the blessings of a loving God who is full of goodness for us. Amen. But sadly, the enemy knows how to reap dirt, disease, demons, darkness, dearth, debt, death, disease, and all kind of deeds. And so as a church, we need to apprehend these wrong things and say, no, we will not have this. We will not tolerate this. We will not accommodate this. We will not try to brand it differently. We need to call sin, sin. But you need to do it lovingly, with kindness, with compassion, with fortitude. Of course, you've got to do it honestly. But you need to do it with the strategy of heaven. Sadly, however, the enemy will not allow this. There is a modern social attitude that strives to brutally punish the offenders with cruel public shaming, boycotting, and ruining a reputation and career, even before ascertaining the facts, even before we know what is really the truth. Before you can ascertain the facts, people have already jumped to conclusion. This modern form of witch hunt is the cancel culture that has no qualm of retaliating against speech, behavior, or even thought that has been prejudged as offensive or even controversial. This vicious form of social arrogance asserts that truth is a matter of interpretation. Truth is subjective in this day and age. What may be truthful for you may not be so much for me, they say. While tolerance, even of a deviant lifestyle, is to be upheld as the highest virtue. Tolerate anything and everything. Let sleeping dog lie. Let sin be sin. Like I said earlier on, let's try to package it in a more appropriate covering. Sadly, when a culture begins to tolerate immorality and evil, it tends to be rash, spiteful, judgmental, and unforgiving. And that is something that I know because I've been at the receiving end of it. Because I chose to be truthful, I chose to be honest, and I chose to be responsive to the calling of God in my life. The most effective way to counter this demonic tendency is for true believers to inculcate the prophetic heart of compassion of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, whenever Jesus comes across a penitent sinner, his heart is kind, forgiving, and gentle 
ready to draw such a soul into restorative grace. We must passionately host the presence of the Holy Spirit in our own hearts so that he is the one who will release the truth in a world that is caught in the grip of the hordes of hell. Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 12, verse 35 to 37, he says, the good man brings good things out of the good stored up in, his, in him. And the evil man bring, brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words, you will be acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned. Our words should represent the culture of the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ as we minister to heal, to restore, to deliver, and to bless lost souls. That can only happen if we learn to humble ourselves so the Lord will release prophetically through us. This is not about declaring end time fire and brimstone over the planet. And if you're participating in such dark outbursts, I urge you to examine what kind of spirit you're attentive to. Because there are all kinds of spirit. The Bible tells us in the first letters of John that we need to test the spirit. So you need to be careful when you become judgmental, when you become arrogant, when you become holier than thou. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 1 says, Let love be your highest goal. But you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives. Especially the ability to prophesy. You remember the book of Genesis when young Joseph began to relate and talk about his prophetic dreams. It brought out the worst in his family members. Of course his brothers were no saints. Yet when Joseph painted his dreams, it was actually more about promoting himself at their expense. So no wonder they reacted the way that they did. They kidnapped him, sold him off as a slave. Why? They said, let us see what happened to the dreams of this dreamer. His own brothers, his own flesh and blood. Remember, prophecy is called a gift because it's not about you. Rather, it's for you to bless those who need mercy, comfort and protection during times of crippling doubt. One thing that you should know about gifts, especially when they are divine gifts, it's not about the receiver, it's about the giver. It's not even about the gift, not about how you're going to use the gift. It's always about our giver. Once you focus on the giver, the gifts will keep on giving. Amen. You can quote me on that. Once you've learned to be grateful, there is something that's going to happen to your gift. It will accelerate, multiply, and become even more divine. Amen. Sadly, however, many are more adept and prone to hurt, harm, and frighten those who may have been expecting encouragement, relief, and strength from us. The church in moments of difficulties. We need to be the voice of the Holy Spirit who will help people not only to understand the logistics of the valley we are going through, but more importantly, to be comforted, consoled, and blessed. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, he says, Everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Don't practice the Jonah's kind of prophetical approach. He preached viciously with hatred and vengeance. And although the Ninevites repented at first, they backslided to their old ways and they were finally destroyed. 
Why? Negativity was flowing out from the preacher's mouth. A cursed release will always find demons held in to oppress and destroy those that you are cursing. And don't forget this, even you who is cursing. We need to allow the Spirit of the Lord to initiate His grace, His compassion, particularly during troubled times. That is why Jesus called the Holy Spirit our comforter. In John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said, But the comforter, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things. And He will cause to recall everything I have told you. Everything that I have told you. The Holy Spirit loves to teach. He wants to align us with God's next move. He wants to convict us while he comforts and suits us with God's fatherly concern. Every morning when I pray, I always include a few lines that I speak directly to the Holy Spirit. And you know how I addressed him? Spirit of my father. There's a connection. He's not some vague abstract energy or force. He's not some vibes. He's the heart of my dad. He's the substance of love that comes from heaven directly from me. Get that. He is the comforter because you are and I am always in need of comfort. You see, the Holy Spirit always has our best interests at heart. And he will use us as his instrument of blessings, especially when it comes to our ministry and our mission. You see, I'm ordinarily, why should I come here and walk this whole way throughout every Sunday? Why should I work so hard to do all of that research about cancel culture? I have other things to do, places to go, people to meet, life to live. But you see, the love of Jesus compelled me. So I would sit. So I would research. So I would hunt and seek. Not just the knowledge of the world, but first, what he wants to speak and deliver to you Sunday. And when I catch his heart, I catch his compassion, his love. And I knew that he's going to bring you. And he knew that you're going to come because he's going to bring you here. And he knew what you're going to need. And because you're going to need it, he puts it in my heart first so that I can process it right from last Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then now this is happening. It's the Father's concern and love for you. He always wants to comfort you. You know why? You're his kids. Amen! Praise the Lord! That's the compassion of Jesus. That's the heart of the Father in the Holy Spirit. So what should we do in order to help those who are bound by their own wrong choices and bad breaks in life? Should we just ignore their weaknesses and failures and go on cajoling and indulging them? What should I do with people who comes up with all of these wrong choices and bad habits? So I need to do something. I cannot ignore, I cannot just indulge them. Do I just surrender them to the Lord and that's it? No, before you minister over the lives of the hurt and the broken, remember it is an uphill task. It's an uphill task. As such, there are two particular viewpoints that you must develop as you help them to climb their spiritual journey in life. If you're interested, Pay attention. First, when you're climbing someplace, remember this. Don't look down. Don't look down. It's a mistake. Even if you want to, don't. It's crazy. Anyone who is a careful climber, whether it is up a cliff, a mountain, or any height, 
They know that it is a dangerous thing to look straight down while on a perch. It can trigger a vertigo-like sensation. And you might lose your balance and footing in such a dangerous place. Similarly, in the spirit realm, there are dizzying effects of accusations and rebukes that can block those you are ministering to from seeing the graceful nature and the graceful future that the Lord has for them. Our negativity can drive many to hopelessness and condemnation as they look down to where they could backslide. All right, but what about someone who is a perennial disaster and who is in the habit of taking advantage of our care and empathy? You have people like that, right? But what I want to tell you is this. Is what about those friends, those cousins, those X, those Y, those Zs, who will come into your life and who will take advantage of your care and empathy? What about them? While we cannot afford to be naive and gullible, the Holy Spirit will grant us discernment to correct and even gently rebuke while the truth is revealed. Remember, just because we have met a few insolent rebels, it does not mean that others will be the same. And even those rebels, they know why they've crossed the line. And they know that they've done something wrong. But at all times, remember this, that some will come and some will go. You win some, you lose some. Even Jesus, he had 12 disciples, lost one. One bunk classes and bunked forever. Each person is uniquely different, even though they may have fallen into the same pits of bad habits and disgrace. When you are counseling someone, you're not the only one who's studying their character. They too are studying you in your heart by the way that you speak and respond to them. I like this picture. Some of you know that you are you here. And you're not the one who's being shouted at. You're the one who's shouting. And you know why? Because we feel that we need to correct that person. And we need to do it strongly, brutally, fiercely, passionately, relentlessly. Those are the words of our pastor. But I want you to know something. That sometimes our action speaks louder than words. The Samaritan woman at the well, the prostitute about to be stoned in Jerusalem, Zacchaeus and many others suffered terribly under the cancel cultures of their contemporaries. But when they met Jesus, who was not only different, he was protective, he was forgiving, and most of all, honest with each of them. You can never correct a thief by calling him a thief. He already knows who he is and he doesn't need you to remind him any further. He doesn't want to have a thesis from you regarding what it means to do with thievery. Every time that you use the word thief, anyone here who has stolen something, it puts a cring in your heart, right? Yes or no? A few thieves around. But somehow along the way, even if we've not been stealing something, we've been lying somewhere, we've been dishonest somewhere, we've been um, hurting someone, and we've harmed ourselves along the way. But all our accusations and threats can never help anyone. Otherwise, our jails and prisons would have been revival hubs by now. Yes, there are prison ministry. I've preached in jail, in the Shillong jail. And I've had a few prisoners coming up and say, Praise the Lord, brother. Chris Volatin, the associate pastor of the Bethel Church at Reading. He once wrote, We are to carry God's authority into the lives of people and nations through invitation, not through intrusion or invasion. 
Although we are called to be combative. When dealing with the powers of darkness, he said, we are to be honorably confronting when it comes to people. Demonstrating the benefits and rewards of a superior kingdom. So when we are in the habit of castigating and maligning others, whether they are really wrong or not, let me tell you this, we create an atmosphere of dark oppression that will crush the victim into more hurt and the perpetrator into deeper demonic influences. Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 7, verse 3 to 5, and why worry about a speck in your friend's eye? Whoa, look at that. When you have a log in your own how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite! First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the specks in your friend's eye. You can never be fruitful in the kingdom of God if you are prejudiced and full of malice against anyone. When we store bitterness and hurt inside a victim mentality, we tend to see the whole world as always wrong and perverted. All our hurts and brokenness would always make us suspect anyone, especially those with whom we disagree or don't understand. There are so many hot-hearted believers who believe that they are doing God a favor by refusing to give anyone a chance. They sit on their judgment throne and they passed out verdict as if it's chocolate. You're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you too, you too, all of you. They are blinded to the inherent goodness in God's creation and can never see the potential of a wonderful future for any sinners, simply because they are focused on their tainted past. Don't be focused on the tainted past of anyone. You've got a past. Oh my God, I've got a past. <laughs> Please remember to read Proverbs 19.11. A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. Sadly, our opinions of others are colored by the darkness in our own hearts. Chris Volatin goes on to say that our opinion of others says more about who we are than about who they are. You see, you measure other people's mistakes by your own yardstick. Imagine if you don't feel good about your performance at work. You will be convinced that your colleagues who are high performers, including your boss, they hate or are jealous of you and are out to get you. People with an orphan mentality or a poverty mindset are almost always suspicious of those who are well off. They believe that money is evil and that somehow the rich must be corrupted or evil in some way or form. This could be true in some cases. But to jump to conclusion about someone you've never met without digging for fags shows a heart that is bound in jealousy, greed, and spite. We usually judge others by our own yardstick, I told you that. And we refuse to accept that God has the power to transform sinners into saints. Everybody hated, hated Zacchaeus. They have different names for him. But when Jesus walked down the road of Jericho, he looked up the sycamore tree and he says, you come down, buddy. We're going to have dinner tonight. Go, cook fast. Because tonight I'm coming and salvation is coming along with me to your home. Amen. We will never be a blessing to anyone unless we inculcate the heart of the one who is always blessing us in spite of our faults, in spite of our failings. If we are in the habit of accusing, condemning, and cursing, we have actually inculcated the heart of the, of the accuser, Satan. Satan loves to accuse. 
Many relish destroying the good name of others while hiding under the anonymity of social networks, not realizing that they are mindless pawns used by the devil to sow discord and hatred. How you value yourself affects the way you view God, the devil, and others. And this will have a huge impact on how you minister to people, especially when they are in need. It's tiring to hear many describing God as a vicious taskmaster who is turning against his own creation because he hates not just sin, but the sinner. Who God is to us, he will be through us. But remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Only an angry, merciless God can create harsh, mean, judgmental, and graceless ministers. So when you minister to anyone, whatever past or extra baggage they may have, teach them as they climb the heights of God's grace, never to look back down into the abyss of past sin, into the abyss of indignity of yesterday, of last week or last month or last event that is all past and it was crucified at the cross. Amen. Jesus paid the price. We are forgiven and we are made whole. What we do with the now depends very much on how we feel and accept the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. When the Lord prophesied about the end, he said to himself in Luke chapter 21, verse 28, look up for your salvation is near. Don't look down. Look up. Don't ever forget that. When you're sick, when you're bound, when you're depressed, when you are in doubt, when you're fearful, when you're going through a bad time, don't look to your past. Paul says, forgetting the past, I press towards the mark. That is my higher calling in Christ Jesus. So my dear brothers and sisters, look up. Your salvation is coming down. Amen. Number two, after you've looked up, Look beyond. Look beyond. Many think that when they have drawn people out of the rut of the old life into the newness of salvation, everything will be hunky-dory. Everything will be magnificent. Everything will be fine. Well, initially it may seem so if that's the first time at the mountaintop of being redeemed. But deliverance is not magic. And although all things are passed away and all things are made new, there is still so much to do, so much to process, and so much to work at. So that your fresh believing friend will develop spiritual muscles and gain maturity. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Let me tell you this. The road of salvation is not just a one-time mountaineering expedition. After you reach a peak, your spiritual eyes will gain insight and you will see to the next level, beckoning you on to deeper intimacy and a passionate intensity with the lover of your soul. Our pilgrimage here on earth is from glory to glory and from strength to strength by the grace of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Such spiritual exercise will keep us humble and alive to the dynamics of the Father's heart who needs us to keep up with all his plans and all of his purposes. That's why you will never regard yourself as the accomplished perfectionist who has arrived and everyone else is always less than you in comparison to your spiritual mileage. Don't ever think like that. 
You may act as if you're humble in front of the world, but you don't have the humility of Jesus. And that's a bad thing to live with. Also, you will never put down or mock anyone's struggle and journey. For you will always remember who you were before the Lord found you. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, verse 2 and verses 3, what did he say? And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Sometimes you may meet with a person who looks so full of faith. Compared to you, you're like, me. <laughs> I feel as if I'm in kindergarten class, KG. This one looks as if they're doing PhD. It's a measure of faith, my dear. You see, when it comes to healings and miracles, your measure of faith could be just... Okay? But for others, it could be one huge syntax or even one huge water tanky. But for others, it's just a whiff. But the person who has just a whiff of faith when it comes to miracles and signs and wonders could have a giant faith when it comes to facing adversity or reaching out or sowing into the kingdom of God. To each a measure of faith. And to each you have a placement in the body of Christ as and when you were created in him. And you were all created. We were all born in Christ. So we all have a measure of faith according to our respective calling. You see, Paul says that each of us are like the different parts of the human body. The eye cannot see to the nose because you're not an eye, you cannot see, so therefore you cannot be a part of this body. What if the whole body becomes an eye? You can see, but you can't smell. You can see, but you cannot hear. You can see, but you cannot walk, you cannot work, you cannot... It's crazy. So each of us We've got our own funda going. And it is according to the measure of faith that God has given to each one of us. A wonderful example of such an understanding is Moses, who may have reached the end of his ministry and his journey of life. Yet he enjoyed standing from the peak of Mount Nebo, catching a glimpse of the promised land. But I want you to understand, he stood from that peak there. He's finished his mission. He may not be able to get to the promised land. He may not be able to get there himself. But he rejoiced to visualize what will culminate in the lives of those whom he had mentored and led through the many years of ministry. Deuteronomy chapter 33 starts with, Now this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Then follows 28 incredible verses of this great leader releasing prophecies of blessing and favors for each of the tribes of Israel. It's time we inculcate the graceful blessing of God to speak blessings, not curses, shalom, and not damnation in the lives of those who still have mountains to climb and valleys to cross. Earlier on, we remember how Joseph's prophetic blustering caused his brothers to hate him and to go against him. But his years in the presence of the Lord must have helped him to become God's instrument of grace when he finally revealed himself to his brothers. Listen to his words in Genesis chapter 45, verse 5 to 8. But don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. 
So it was God who sent me here, not you. What a forgiving heart. These 10 brothers of his, they pushed him into a pit. They took away his coat, which was their point of jealousy. They tore it. And then they sold it off. They sold their own brother as a slave. And when he reached Egypt as a slave, he was used in the house of Potiphar. And there he was wrongly accused and put in jail from the frying pan to the fire now. But you see, through all of his adversity, through all of the problems and the issues that he was facing, God was mentoring and preparing and molding and shaping Joseph to be what? Son of Jacob? All right. But more importantly, the prime minister of Egypt. Why God could see the end from the beginning. Not only of just Joseph, yours and mine and every one of us here and those who will be watching this on YouTube. God knows your future. He's already designed it. And you may frisk and frolic here and there, but he'll get you through only if you will trust and believe. So when Joseph forgave his brother, what did you see there? That's the maturity of a prophet who knows how to speak not just kindness and forgiveness, but his prophetic release is already setting up a destiny that eventually will mold them into a mighty nation out of Egypt. God is taking us into a prophetic platform so we can speak grace and breakthroughs upon the lost and the fearful that will be increased in the kingdom of our Lord. Well, some may say that they do not have the personality to be compassionate towards those who have rebelled against the Lord and his authority. But the Holy Spirit seeks to mend the brokenhearted, deliver the captives from fear, and heal the sick. As prophetic people, we earnestly need to listen to the Holy Spirit, not allow our personality to dictate terms. Who I should forgive and who I shouldn't forgive. You come in repentance, welcome home. That's the heart of the father of the prodigal son, said Jesus. Who am I to argue with my Lord? Amen? If he can forgive a thief in the cross, if it was me in the cross, he says, shut up man, I'm suffering. Lord, please. Chup karo. But no. Tonight I assure you, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Awesome. So we need to be mindful of love and forgiveness when we minister in the power of the Lord. Lest we become destructive instead of constructive. Second Corinthians chapter 5. You all know these verses 17 to 19. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the what? The ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the what? The message of reconciliation. Hey, if God is not counting sin against sinners, what give us the right to do so? Pointing out people's sin will never lead anyone to reconciliation with God. It's time we have the mind of Christ who sees sinners as God's children. And so therefore he will leave the 99 at home and he'll go and search for the ones out there. Remember they need a whole load of grace and patience and a lot less of nagging and condemning. So if you have that difficult son, that difficult spouse, or that difficult sibling, little less nagging, little less condemning, and more of encouraging, a whole lot more of compassion, and a lot more of patience. And remember, you lose nothing to say. 
You drive me insane, but I still love you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come in the blessed name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. I thank you that you've drawn us so close to you, drawn us so much like a father who loves us, who cares for us. And you've given us this opportunity to not only come ourselves to you as the prodigal son returned home. Father, Father, do your work in our midst. Do your work in our midst. Dad, I'm here. They're here. You're here. Let's do it. Holy Spirit, come, come, come. Holy Spirit, come. Cleanse, cleanse, perch, anoint. Hey. 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 Let not me let me not be the elder brother of the prodigal son. Who's sulking, who's angry, who's jealous, envious, possessive. Let me be forgiving, compassionate, kind, gentle, noble, pure, just like you, Jesus. The blood of Jesus over each one here, over each person in this room, over everyone who's watching this online, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the precious blood of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your power, for your grace, for the special anointing in this room right now. Oh, mm. oh. okay. Are you ready now? Come on, people, are you ready? Let me just come and release the presence of the Lord tangibly among each one of you. Hallelujah. All right. Are you ready, people? All right, now just close your eyes for a few seconds and for a couple of minutes. And God's going to put in your heart a name or a face or a sensing, a sensation about somebody. You know, sometimes our mom, we can still remember the smell of our mom, even though, you know, for example, like me, I've lost my mother since 1998, but I still retain in my memory the senses of her, of her aroma her incense, her smell. So maybe you might have a sensation like that of somebody, a smell even, or a figure. Close your eyes and God's going to impress you with this person. Could be a cousin, a sibling, a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, a friend, a colleague, a somebody from the past, somebody who may have hurt you, or somebody who may have insulted you, offended you, or somebody who has been very, very grievous. Come on, people. Just allow the Lord to put that in your heart right now. Ready? Okay. As he puts it, that person's in your heart. I want you to quietly raise your right hand. If God has put a person in your heart right now, and you remember that person, no matter how offended you may have been with that person, you just want right now to bring that person in prayer before God. Just raise your right hand. Quickly, can you stand up? 
we'll pray together for them okay ready first i will pray and then i will lead you in a prayer my dear dad i bring your daughters your sons all of these your kids before you and we are bringing people in our memory people in our spirit persons whom we are burdened with we bring them before you and as we bring them before you we bring them with no judgment we bring them with no arrogance with no pride we just bring them before you and we ask we ask that you would have mercy and grace to draw them into your life they are here in our hearts and we promise that as we go together in prayer you will draw them closer to you jesus please help us that when we pray right now it will be authentic it will be real it will be awesome miracles will happen signs and wonders will occur and many will be drawn into a place of being captivated with you jesus but first i bring these your children before you dad draw them so close to your heart let them enter into your throne room right now right now there in the power of the father yeah that's the anointing of the father mm. that's the power of god you will be filled with the love of the father for that person that you are bringing right now it will not be your own love but it will be the love of god the love and the compassion and the joy that only god can give you you're bringing i know some of you you're bringing your your spoiled and problem child a son perhaps a daughter a spouse a husband or a wife a mother a father a brother a sister a cousin or maybe you're bringing the name of your boss or the name of the one who had oppressed you a bully somebody who insults you ready are we ready for this All right, I want you to do something with me as you stand, raise your right hand real high and say, "Father, in the name of Jesus, I bring now quietly bring out that name. I mean, you can just whisper the name. I bring Some of you may have more than one name so give out all of those names. To you. To you. Dear Father. Jesus. Welcome them into your family in the kingdom. whatever they've done against you against me or against anyone your blood can cleanse it can wash all of their sins and make them whole father you are the father of prodigals and i am one of those just as i have been welcome back home 
please welcome these precious souls in my memory and in my burden. I'm not supposed to carry them or shoulder their pain and so I surrender them in your arms at the foot of the cross. Do whatever needs to be done to heal them, to deliver them, to bless them and to protect them. Heal them, deliver them and bless them. Bless me, bless my home, my work and the ministry that I have here with you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, let's bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, just flow in prayer now. You've become a reconciler. Just bring yourself before the Lord and just flow. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, I loved you. Lord, I love 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 you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Rama siki kira seka bakora ya sheketrayande. Come on, come on, just bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Come on, bless Jesus. Open your heart to Jesus. Flow, flow in this glory and in this grace. Let him touch you, let him hug you, let him embrace you. Let him just hold you close to him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hey, come back home, come back home. Be reconciled with your dad. Flow, 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 flow. Flow in that glory, flow in that grace, flow in that joy. Know that you are loved. Remember that you are accepted in the beloved. You are God's child. You are blessed. You are loved. Father, please heal anybody who needs healing in this room right now. Those who are watching us online, heal them from any infirmities. Route out any sickness or disease that may have been binding them. Cancel the curse from their life. Assign angels over their work, over their needs, 
and over their protection. And may they flow in the joy of your goodness and of your mercy. As you continue to bless your people daily. And help us Lord Jesus. To be a testimony. Throughout the rest of this week. Identifying ourselves with Jesus. And knowing that he loves us. And that he cares for us. We bless you Jesus. We love you. With a love that comes only from you. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.